Hi. This was um, Unit 4, um, the European Renaissance in general, the Italian Renaissance, which we'll cover live next week, um, and then the Baroque, and today, as well as the, sorry, Mannerism, and today we're going to cover the Northern European Renaissance. So Northern European does not necessarily mean North Europe. You'd think it would, but no. Uh, it just kind of means north of Italy. So the Northern European Renaissance basically in would include the modern-day countries of Germany. I hope you can see the arrow. Um, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and England. Um, sometimes you will see, depending on the textbook, Spain thrown in there as well. Because um, it's north of the Alps. To get there, if you were walking, remember this is walking and or taking a horse, not taking a boat, which is obviously just west to east here, well, east to west. Um, but it's still, since it's north of the Alps to get there, Spain would still kind of be wrapped up into the northern renaissance as, as well as Portugal. Um, so it's not that it makes much sense when you hear northern renaissance, but just so you understand. So the northern renaissance... Um, has two influencing factors. One, it's still very heavily influenced by the Gothic period. And of course, now the new ideas um, that are coming out of Italy and the Italian Renaissance start to um, spread out to the rest of Europe. Um, so the major difference is France, Spain, Italy are still predominantly Catholic, still today even, but still during the Renaissance, predominantly Catholic. And Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, England... Uh, um, <clears throat> Belgium start out all Catholic as well. Remember, there's only one kind of Christianity at this point in time. But during the Renaissance, due to the invention of the printing press m m mostly, um, the break of, up of the Catholic Church happens, often called the Protestant Reformation. So pro protesting against the Catholic Church, Protestant is the word that it comes from. And different versions of Christianity start to pop up during the Renaissance. So for the first 1,400 years, technically for the first 1,500 years from Christ's birth, I guess, if you want to consider that the beginning of Christianity, until 1517, so 1,517 years, there's only one church that's Christian, and that's the Catholic Church. Again, any other church, and you will hear them say it, they say, we've been around for 2,000 years. No, they haven't. The only church that can say that is the Catholic Church. Other churches, the oldest they could be is 500 years. Most of them are less than 200. Some started two weeks ago. So, so important events that happened during the Euro Northern European Renaissance um, is Henry VIII becomes king of England. Everyone knows Henry VIII and all the fun he had with his wives. Most importantly is Martin Luther. No, not Martin Luther King. There are two big Martin Luthers in history. Martin Luther, the uh, Catholic monk, who once the Bible was two things, put in a printing press, which means everybody could get one and afford one, about 50 bucks a Bible, rather than in the Middle Ages where you're paying $500,000 for one chapter of the Bible. Um, so now an entire Bible could be 50 bucks. And two, translating the Bible into local languages. So not just Latin and Greek anymore. Now the Bible can be in English, in Spanish, in French, in Italian, in German. Right. So Martin Luther who was well-trained in Latin and, and Greek anyway, because he was a, a Roman Catholic monk, gets a, his hands on an entire Bible um, and reads it through and through and up and down and left and right and finds 95 things that the Catholic Church says are true nowhere listed in the Bible um, that have been traditionally accepted to be true, and he thinks that basically after reading it himself, they made it up. If you're interested in what those 95 things are, there's a link here so you can see them. Uh, obviously, he posts this list of 90 things, 95 things he thinks the Catholic Church gets wrong, posts it on a cathedral in the city of Wittenberg, which is, again, modern-day Germany. And that basically starts the Protestant Reformation. Um, because the German princes of the region, even though it's all under the Holy Roman Empire, the local regional princes are having a hard time um, with the Pope at that particular time, and basically rather than arresting Martin Luther, which is what would have happened 50 years before, if, if he did this in 1487 instead of 1517, um, hide him from them 
and his ideas catch fire and he starts the first non-catholic church and obviously it gets named after him not right away but it does later it's called the lutheran church it still exists you can go visit a lutheran church any, anywhere there's several in miami there's not a lot of difference between catholic and lutheran um, and there's not a lot of difference between Henry VIII's version of Christianity, which is called Anglican, um, and in, in the United States it changed its name to Episcopalian, but it's the same thing, it just has a different name. Um, the only difference between those three versions of Christianity are specific doctrines that are different. But if you went to church in an Anglican or slash Episcopalian church, or went to church in a Lutheran church, or went to church in a Catholic church, if you went in and sat through the Mass, you would probably not notice any difference whatsoever in how the Mass was when you sit, when you kneel, when you stand, when you pray, um, when you get up and receive the host, um, uh, the prayers, the songs, all like about 95, 96% the same. Uh, there are saints around the church, um, statues, the whole nine yards at, at the church. No, no, like I said, no major difference. The differences are, are purely in smaller details. For example, in Lutheranism and in Anglican slash Episcopalian, priests can get married. Um, and there's a couple of other differences, um, most of them theological, more so than, than the stuff that's, that's happening. Uh, another guy that breaks away is John Calvin. He starts what's called the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which becomes later Calvinism, named after him. Uh, which is a very a unique religion that believes in predestination, which is basically before you were born, God decided whether you were going to heaven and hell. Um, so it doesn't matter how good or you live, per se, you're still going to heaven or hell. Um, it's a unique version and perspective. Um, if you're interested, again, you can look up to it. So obviously the Catholic Church has to respond to all this breaking away. So what they create is called what we call today the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola. Um, uh, there's l Jesuit schools all over the place. Probably the most famous here in Miami is Belen. Um, the point and the job of Jesuits was to convert people back that had quit the Catholic Church and joined these new Christianities. It is still the job of the Jesuit Church. Most people don't know that. They're the job, they're the branch that goes out and tries to convert people. Um, then there's another break with Christianity in the 1500s in France, a group of Protestants called the Huguenots. Uh, there's a big problem there in France. We're we'll, not really going to cover the history. Like I said, we're more doing the art, but still, so you know. Again, really important, the Bible comes out in local languages. So the famous King James Version of the Bible, which is the standard Bible for English from 1600 to 2000, it has now recently just changed in the past 20 years. And people have other versions, the New Standard Revised Version, the NIV Version, etc. and so on. But the King James Bible is by far the most famous. Everybody, whether or not you're Christian, um, has heard the Ten Commandments. And you all know the famous thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Right? Everyone knows thou, thee, thither. That all comes from the King James Version of the Bible. Um, obviously important um, for the first time, we're going to run into colonial America in our stent towards art. So America is going to enter the picture because the original colonies are established in the 1600s as well. Um, Science-wise, you have some shocking news. <laughs> um, they, Johannes Kepler and later Galileo Galilei confirmed that the sun is at the center of the solar system and not the Earth. And that may not sound like a big deal today, because we all know it's true, but in the 1600s, um, it was shocking, because everything people had been taught is that the Earth was the center of the, not just the solar system, but the universe, because it says so in the Bible. Um, and to find out that that wasn't true was shocking. I mean, most of these people who say it get excommunicated, some of them even get killed, but, you know, the evidence was there. Um, some other big steps is to figure out how blood goes circulates through the system. I know that, again, something you'd learn in an early anatomy course, but nobody knew how blood went from the heart to the lungs to the brain, etc., throughout the body until then. Um, what else? I'm going to spend too much time on the English or the Germans. And again, red words, you know you have to... will show up on a test somewhere. Um, 
I guess, quick point out Louis XIV. He's the one that you're familiar with, Versailles Palace. Um, is the longest king in European history, and not not queen. Uh, I think Queen Elizabeth just passed this. I'm pretty sure. Okay, so artworks. So the Northern Renaissance, um, again, steals, steals, influenced by ideas from the Italian Renaissance, but still stuck in the Gothic. So there's still a big, big, big push for religious art, where we'll see when we do the Italian Renaissance next week, you'll see the Italian Renaissance still does a lot of religious art. It doesn't turn away from it, but it also does a lot of secular art, a lot of non-religious art, and a lot of even return to pagan stuff. You don't see a lot of return to pagan stuff in the Northern European Renaissance. The Protestant Reformation kind of sees to that. Um, again, that influence of the Gothic that Jesus sacrificed himself for us, and he, sh you know, we shouldn't be paying tribute to ancient pagan gods, no matter how pretty the pictures are. It's part of it. <clears throat> but the skill does improve, as you can kind of see here in this um, sculpture with um, the king, some saint, I forget. I want to say it's Jedekiah, but it might not be. And then Moses over here in the center holding, you know, the commandments. But here you can kind of see what I mean when I said it's stuck in the Gothic. So the Renaissance, again, when we see the Italian Renaissance, you'll see the difference particular. But the Renaissance moves to deeper 3D, better 3D, and um, idealized versions of people for the most part, especially religious figures. Everyday ordinary people, not so much, but religious figures get idealized. So everyone's perfect, everyone's beautiful. The, the Northern Renaissance never takes that into consideration. The importance still is like the Gothic. The importance is the meaning rather than the quality, although it's not necessarily means it's poor quality. But you can see the 3D is kind of weak in this picture. Uh, for those of you who don't know what's going on in the center is Mary uh, and the angel Gabriel coming to tell her she's going to have baby Jesus. On the right panel is Joseph Carpenter, her husband, right, her future husband working in his shop. On the left are the people who paid for the painting, the husband and wife. Um, these are what what are called altar pieces. You're going to see several of those in the Northern Renaissance. They all open up. You might be able to see, and I hope you can see my arrow, but in between the panels you might be able to see the hinges. There's a top hinge and a bottom hinge. They would fold open and or close depending on what you were maybe talking about in the church as the priest or what story you wanted to tell. Right, kind of to keep people interested. Number one, if you had the same painting every day, maybe it gets boring. Um, I don't have that one open, but I'll show you other ones that open. Probably the most famous portrait painter. So in the Northern Renaissance, what really becomes popular, probably much so, more so than in the Italian Renaissance. Although the Italian Renaissance certainly did portraits, is portrait painting, paintings of famous people, of rich people, and quite often, not the last but the first to do paintings of themselves, of the artist. So the Renaissance is all about the individual, and you're going to get a lot of the individual um, artists. So not always are they going to be called a self-portrait, like, for example, this one, Man in a Red Turban, um, is most likely a self-portrait of Jean Van Eyck, um, based upon other pictures of him, draw uh, drawings of him. Um, although it doesn't say that, right? It's just called Man in the Red Turban. Probably the most famous portraitish picture is often called the Wedding Portrait or sometimes called um, the Arnolfini Wedding, as, as it's named here. It has several different names. Uh, sometimes the Arnolfini Wedding Portrait. Um, this is considered Van Eyck's masterpiece. And not, again, again, notice realism isn't really important here. Um, symbolism is, even in portraiture. So the man in the red turban was the, a, a, a portrait, but it was still, the red turban was a symbolic, right? So this painting is probably the easiest one to break down for symbols for you guys, so that's the one I will do, as well as it's a masterpiece. Again, you might look at it and go, what are you talking about, Professor? How is this a masterpiece? <laughs> this guy looks scary as hell, and his wife isn't much better looking. Um, but the masterpiece is in the details, right? Um, and in this amazing ability, which I'll show you in a second, to capture those details. If you look at this painting really quickly, 
You notice that in between the husband and wife in the background is a little circular kind of shape. That's actually a mirror. We'll get to that much as we'll get to that as we go through this painting. I have close ups of it. So what are the symbols in the painting? The first symbol, obvious symbol, maybe, maybe not obvious, is wealth. There's this beautiful golden chandelier up above between them. He's wearing fur, you know, a fur coat. And behind him, which would not be considered as, considered a symbol of wealth today, especially to us in Miami, but behind him on the windowsill, there are some fruits you might be able to see. If not, I can't really zoom in for you, but trust me, those fruits are oranges. Oranges may not be a big deal to someone in Florida, but in the 1400s in Belgium, where this painting was painted, oranges were a rare and exotic fruit. So he's got a ton of money. He can wear fur. He can afford a fancy house with a fancy bed and a fancy chandelier, and he's bringing exotic fruits home. He's our wealthy businessman in this painting, right? There's all the symbology for that. Now, if, if we look to the woman, there's a lot of symbology here, too. So I know that you're probably looking going, she's pregnant. She's not. They're just getting married. They're engaged. Back then, that would have been huge taboo if she was pregnant before they're married. It's symbolic that she is fertile, therefore. It's symbolic she's going to get pregnant because that's what women do. Again, in the 1400s, the idea of what women's jobs were are completely different. So one of those jobs was to be fertility, right? To have fertility, and so she's pregnant. The other thing is symbolic is the bottom right bottom left sorry sorry bottom left if you'll notice there are shoes next to him <clears throat> those are her shoes and why are her shoes there again symbolic that she is a woman she is going to be pregnant and she is going to not need shoes because she's not going to leave the house because a woman's job is to be in the home i'm sure all the women are cringing right now <clears throat> the famous saying a woman should be barefoot and pregnant actually comes from this painting she is barefoot she is you know, seemingly pregnant. And that is the duty of all good women, right, in the 1400s. There's other little symbols here that are not so obvious. The bed being red is symbolic of their love and their passion. The dog between them at the bottom, symbolic that they will be loyal to one another, right? So like I said, symbols are more important than skill. Although this is a really good 3D space, it looks three-dimensional, it's really good. But what's really amazing about this painting is that mirror I told you about in the middle. Actually, you can see in the bottom left, you can see one of the oranges on the window. So, um, so if you look at the mirror closely here, and this is about the size of a 50 cent piece. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the size of a 50 cent piece, a key ring, you know, the keychain ring, the ring part. Um, so in that mirror is the mirror. I can get a closer picture for you. So back of her, back of him, the painter is the guy in the blue. And then next to the painter are two people because those are witnesses to the wedding. But it is an exact mirror image of what he painted in this tiny little spot the size of a key ring. And then around the edges of that tiny little spot are the Stations of the Cross. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Stations of the Cross, but there are 12 Stations of the Cross that Jesus went through when he on the way to get crucified. Um, and there are prayers for each one, so... Is also symbolic of this as a religious family. So this is one of the altarpieces I did want to kind of show you the difference between open and closed. It's probably one of the more famous ones, right? So this is the Ghent altarpiece for the church, or cathedral in Ghent, Belgium. Obviously now it's in a museum, but so you'll notice that this one has eight panels, and if you can't really see the hinges on this one, but trust me, this one opens and folds. So that you can open just the two in the middle, you could open just the top, you could open the two in the bottom, or open the whole bottom, or you could open the whole thing. So that you could have 10 or 12 different combinations at any point in time. And again, the Annunciation is the scene that's happening again here. So here's the angel Gabriel on the left up top, up, um, and Mary on the bottom again are people who paid. And then the statues are saints, and at top of are people in heaven watching over stuff right so this opens up huge as you can see here um this is it fully open on the uh, top again on the far left and far right are adam and eve in the middle is god sitting with mary and john the baptist um and then the bottom is actually the uh, symbolic story of jesus being the sacrificial lamb so at the very center you might see the lamb there Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to stop at a few of the other ones. So some of the other things that the Northern Renaissance is probably most famous for is not the paintings, but the architecture. So what a lot of people probably don't know is that most of the big important buildings in Moscow and St. Petersburg and Russia were actually um, done by hired Italian architects that the Russian czars hired because they wanted to make Russia more European than Asian. It was an actual intentional thing. So, of course, the most famous thing is the Kremlin area. And, of course, the churches that you probably are familiar with some of them. I'm going to stop at all of the churches because they kind of all kind of look alike because, unfortunately, kind of the same designers. But they are still um, originally Catholic, but eventually Russian Orthodox. So Russian Orthodox and Catholic is basically the same. Um, again, very similar, except the Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox, by the way, um, eventually break away from the papacy. And rather than have the Pope be in charge, they have their own Pope, who's called a Patriarch, in charge. It's a little bit more strict than the Catholic Church. Everyone's a little bit, a lot more strict than the Catholic Church. Again, like I said, all the churches kind of get that onion dome thing that you're kind of familiar with from the Byzantine period. You're going to see a lot of that because most of the artists that actually they hired are from the Byzantine part of the world. Probably the coolest place in Moscow is this faceted hall, all of the facets. Not the external. Again, remember, the Italian idea is don't spend too much too much money, too much decoration on the outside. Um, the French are more into that. Um, but spend all your money and all your stuff on the inside. That comes from the Romans, right? So here you can kind of see the inside hallway where they would have banquets, um, meeting the princes, meeting the czar, that kind of stuff. They still use it today, believe it or not. The famous tower in the Kremlin area, part of the wall around the Kremlin. There's several of these towers. They're originally defensive towers. Now they're more so for show. So probably the coolest artist of the Northern Renaissance, maybe the Renaissance in general, that gets certainly the most underrated, that he gets very little um, credit for... Um, this is the right word. Credit. It, it kind of never gets recognized as much as he should as Hieronymus Bosch. Maybe because people can't pronounce his name. <laughs> uh, maybe because his artwork is a little bit way ahead of its time. And so he kind of gets ignored. He is the first artist that we know that dabbled. A I mean, it's not that I, we don't know that other people do. Um, did, other people did or didn't do drugs, but we know for sure he did. He took notes and wrote stuff, so maybe that's part of the reason his artwork is so kind of trippy. But if you look closely at the artwork, it looks like this beautiful, peaceful scene where St. Anthony is sitting near a river, right? The beautiful trees, the city in the background. You can see the church steeples in the, in the far background, a little village closer to the front. But if you look closely at the village and the characters in the village and the characters around St. Anthony, who's sitting there, they're all kind of demonic, uh, weird, twisted characters and, and creatures. He's most famous for this painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, and this is another one of those things that opens and closes, although it doesn't open any more than this. Uh, it does close. If you close it all the way, I don't know if I have a picture. Maybe I do, and we'll see it in a second. If you close it all the way, it's a picture of the Earth, um, the globe you know the earth inside you open it up the left panel is the garden of eden peaceful idyllic times all the animals and humans living coexistently peacefully beautifully the center panel is earth and earthly delights is kind of why they're calling it that and it is humans kind of abusing animals uh doing unnatural things so-called unnatural things um obviously for the time it would have con a lot of the things that are happening in here would have been considered unnatural um, but also other unnatural things that are clearly unnatural even for today's modern times are also in here. And then on the far right is the panel of hell. 
and in hell is the punishment for what we did to the earth. So another thing that he is is actually an early ecologist, an early environmentalist. He felt that in the 1500s we were destroying the earth and twisting things and turning them away from the way nature was meant to, which of course God's creation. So we will be punished in hell for what we've done to the earth. And this is in the 1500s. He already knew that we were damaging the earth, right? So if I, there's the, oh, there you go, if you close it, there you go, there's the kind of global thing. And so you can kind of see the size of it, there's a guy standing in front of the painting. So here's some of the things from the Garden of Eden, a cat killing a mouse, animals, you know, eating, drinking, whatever, it's still kind of phantasmagorical, a little animal here reading a book, right, but living kind of coexistently. But once we get to the middle panel, there's all kinds of stranger things going on. A guy trapped inside of a clamshell, pooping out pearls. A guy trapped in some kind of fruit with a mouse ready to run down the fruit. An uh, interracial couple, which of course would have been considered bad in those days. A guy upside down, coming from his genital area, a fruit with birds popping out of it. Right? All kinds of strange things, if you pay attention to the little details. You could spend hours doing this on this painting. Right, the, inside this little thing with people upside down, and for whatever bizarre reason, are people inside the thing and somebody's ass? I mean, I, I, who knows? People sit, standing around a strawberry for whatever reason. The guy lying down on the ground, the deer smelling him, mermaids, right? All kinds of phantasmagorical creatures, right? And this is all just in the center. Look at all the unnatural things humans are doing, right? Um, the guy pooping out flowers. Um, the owl pooping out people, a guy with a grape for a head, right? All kinds of strange. If you pay really close attention and look really closely at this stuff, you every time you look at this painting, you'll find something new. It's crazy how much detail there is here. Uh, the the boar pooping, it's, it's, it's all bizarre stuff. So hell is the final punishment for doing all these things wrong. And there's all kinds of things in hell. And this got him in a little trouble because he put bishops in hell. He put nuns in hell. He put priests in hell. He dressed up a pig to look like a nun in hell. So there's all kinds of little, here's the nun for you, here's a bishop. Right? Everyone that was bad is going in hell. Here's a guy cut in half inside of him. People are having dinner. Right? All Again, all these tiny, crazy, weird little details. Moth, moth kind of creature over here. The ears with a knife coming out of it with an arrow going through it. Like all kinds of really bizarre little detailed things. My favorite probably thing is the guy who eats people, the bird that eats people and then poops them out into the hole at the underneath. Now, around the hole is a guy throwing it up, another guy pooping, right? Um, and the guy that he's eating, the bird is eating, is pooping birds out of his butt. This is really bizarre things going on. Guy trapped inside the drum while a monster beats on it. Guy holding a giant horn, someone in the top of the horn. Out of the guy's poor butt is a flute, right? Um, I thought I had the pig. There you go. And there's the nun, the pig dressed as a nun. Um, somebody later turned these little creatures from his paintings into sculptures. There's a really cool museum that has all those sculptures. This probably was actually more controversial than that one, believe it or not. Matthias Grunwald's painting of uh, an altarpiece in which it has Jesus crucified. And the reason this painting is controversial, which is kind of silly, but the reason this painting is controversial um, is not because it shows Jesus on the cross dead, although that is kind of a break from tradition. You'll see he's hanging on the cross, kind of chilling. Um, it's because it's so gruesome. So you might not be able to tell here in this picture, but if you look at Christ, he's bleeding. He's got all kinds of stab, stab wounds from the whips. So the Romans, when they whipped people, unlike modern whips, it wasn't just a, a, a whip with strings attached. At the end of each one of those strings was like a nail or a piece of glass or a thorn so that when they whipped you, it would rip into your flesh. So the, uh, the painter of this wanted you to see just how brutal Jesus was treated, right? And how important that sacrifice was, right? That Again, the whole message here. So you might be able to see it a little better here. You see there's all kind of pock marks all over Jesus' body. Um, there's all kinds of blood, blood dripping from his feet, blood dripping from the hole in his side where the um, soldier had stabbed him. Here you can see some of the thorns sticking out, pieces of wood sticking out of his body and his chest, right? And that's the um, when you open it up, the altarpiece. This is when you close it. You get some, a guy copying, a little bit of copycat going on here for Bosch with the phantasmagorical creatures in the right. So the king of self-portraits before Rembrandt, the guy who kind of made it into 
a potential way to make money is uh, this guy, Albrecht Durer. But what Albrecht Durer really did, more so than self-portraits, is Albrecht Durer created the first mass production of artwork. So rather than just make one of these that you see in front of you, what he did is he carved a reverse carving, a mirror image, in wood of the scene he wanted to do. And then he took ink, poured a tray full of ink, took the wood carving, put it into the ink till it goes soaked, right? Took it off, took it, got a piece of paper and stamped it on the piece of paper. Voila, one work of art. Stamp it again. Voila, two works of art. Stamp it again. Three works of art, etc. and so on. And so he does this for a lot of works of art. One of his more famous ones is Adam and Eve. <clears throat> so if you look closely at Eve, looks more like Steve. So this should be Adam and Steve. And there is a rumor unverified that it is Albert Durer, self-portrait again, and Louis Leon Battista Alberti, self-portrait, who was his lover, and he may have actually been doing Adam and Steve here. Uh, again, several of these, um, and you can see the kind of detail that he spent on these wood carvings and then being able to kind of mass produce them. Probably one of his most famous ones, and I, I would tell you I've seen this tattoo at least four times on people, is the praying hands. But he did also do paintings. So everyone's heard of Henry VIII, so this is what he looked like for those who didn't know what Henry VIII looked like. Yeah, we all know Henry VIII is much more famous for his wives than anything. <laughs> well, he did create the religion, right? He broke away with the Catholic Church and created the Anglican Church, again, Episcopalian in America. But you can see here in the picture, he was not like the TV show on HBO, The Tudors, the, the series, The Tudors. Six foot four, 185 pounds, gorgeous man with blue eyes and sexy as all hell. You can see that instead he was a big man, but not quite big in the way that they show in the TV show. As a matter of fact, Henry VIII is so huge, they actually had to breed special horses for him, named Henry VIII horses, obviously named after him, because regular horses were like, get off me. Um, unfortunately. So probably the coolest part of the Northern Renaissance is in France, and what the French are best known for are the French architectural things. They created several chateaus and villas um, for the French king, so he could live like a king wherever he traveled on vacation. So all of these small palaces that you're going to see, and a small <laughs> is a relative term here, were for the king when he went on vacation for two weeks, three weeks. Um, so these were temporary residences. They were, you know, maintained by staff year-round. But for the most part, those staff were pretty much on their own 11 months of the year. Um, and that one month where the king would come to go hunting or the king would go to escape from Paris and the hubbub of Paris, and he would stay at one of these smaller palaces nearby. This particular one is Fontainebleau. No, not the Hilton on the beach. But it was um, actually used all the way to Napoleon. Um, he even spent some time here. For the most part, they are smaller than you think. But again, the French hired uh, Italian painters and Italian architects to come and design most of these places. And of course, eventually the French architects learned from the Italians and started to do it themselves. So one of those smaller palaces, and by smaller, I mean um, it only has 45 bedrooms, um, is Chenon So, uh, which is sometimes spelled with an X and sometimes not spelled with an X, which is why you see that weird X there. Um, what you're looking at is the bridge part of it. That is just the bridge part. The back part, which you can barely see over here, is the chateau itself with the 40 bedrooms. Um, to the left, you can see one of the towers. To the right is another tower, and underneath each tower is a garden. Those gardens were two completely, basically the same garden. One was for the king's wife, one was for the king's mistress. He didn't want them to hang out together, so he built them separate gardens. But he also had them in the same house. The largest of those chateaux is the Chateau de Chambord. Uh, Chambord actually is a famous liqueur for those who drink. Um, it is made by monks in a monastery that is near the chateau. Um, it's kind of like an after-dinner drink. Um, 
this is the largest 440 bedrooms, uh, 365 chimneys, 85 staircases. It's kind of set up like a castle. Um, on the roof, which you can't see, and I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately, but you can look it up online. They actually rebuilt a tiny little village for the kids, the kids' king, the king's kids to play, like with little carriages, little houses, the whole nine yards. Um, in the in the center is this double spiral staircase, kind of looks like DNA, uh, that they believe may have been designed by Leonardo da Vinci. The point of having the double spiral staircase is so servants could be going up and down the steps at the same time, serving stuff, platters, etc., and so on, and never run into each other and cause traffic. There's also a really cool ramp staircase. I don't know if I have a picture of it. Um, and the ramp staircase is flat rather than having steps, and the reason for that is so that the king, when he wanted to, could take his horse into the palace and walk up the steps with the horse, because, you know, he's the king. So it has all kinds of... Here's, the, here's that double staircase for the the double spiral staircase, so you'd go up one side and come down the other side and not run into each other. The front is stables for the horses, of course. There's servant quarters, and then obviously inside the palace, 440 rooms. So you're like, wait a minute, the king didn't have 440 kids. No, but when the king traveled, he brought the entire court with him. So all of the nobility traveled with the king. So smaller ones like Shalane, again, smaller, 120 rooms, right? Um... Blois and Ambois, Am 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 again, 120 rooms or so. Uh, Am Ambois is famous for uh, that chapel you see in the right, bottom right. So the right picture, bottom right corner of the right picture, you'll see a tiny little thing that looks like a church. It's actually where Leonardo da Vinci was buried. He died in France. Um, on the left is Usay, and the right is Chinon. Chinon you might know more famously for Joan of Arc. These, are, again, are smaller chateaus. The king spent all his time all over the place. And this one on the left, Asse Le Rideau, has a pretty funny story we'll get to. And the one on the right is Villandry. Villandry is much more famous, again, for its gardens. You'll notice you can see the gardens. They change throughout the year. They are never the same. They're constantly cut and changed and new flowers, new patterns, new designs. And they kind of recycle themselves every five or six years. It costs about $13 million a year to maintain this garden. And so when the French economy collapsed a couple of years ago, when we had that big collapse, they were basically f going to fire all the gardeners and, you know, let the garden go to hell until the economy came back. But the French people, and this is why I love the French sometimes, um, actually the entire country went on strike saying, if you're going to fire the gardeners, you're not going to be able to do anything. No trains, no buses, no taxis, nothing. No one's going nowhere. And so the French government was like, forget it. I guess we'll let the gardens go. Um, the one on the left is a funnier story. As they were doing, only has about 40 bedrooms, 35 to 40, I forget. So when it was finished, and it's the prettiest one, believe it or not, like inside is really cool, etc. Um, and they have this really cool show if you ever get to France and you ever go to any of these chateaus. They're all 20, 30 minutes outside of Paris for the most part. Some maybe 45. Um, they have this laser light show at night where they kind of tell the history of the French kings who built these. It's pretty cool. And it's like they laser beam the front of the palace and they light it up. It's, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, is when it was finished, the king was like, this is too small. This is useless. I don't know what the heck I'm going to do with it. And he gave it to a gift. He gave it as a gift to one of his secretaries. Obviously, the famous one in Paris is the Louvre. I know that you think the Louvre, you think museum. And that is because it is a museum now, but it was originally one of the palaces of the, the palace of the French king when he was in Paris. Later, it would become Versailles, which is about 15 minutes outside of Paris. The English also do these big castle-like things for their wealthy people. Um, unfortunately, most of those palaces have been destroyed or re <clears throat> repurposed for something else. Hampton Court's one of the few that stayed from the Renaissance. But again, you can kind of see, let me go back, uh, maybe not, yeah. You can kind of see that Gothic still influencing it right stained glass windows those weird not weird those really high ceilings with the weird kind of pinnacles coming down um i think everybody looks at this as the candy cane church this is saint basil cathedral also in moscow um now it's a museum because uh when the soviet union became 
took over, when the Russian Communist Revolution took over, they banned religion. And so this became a museum. And now that you can be religious again in Russia, they never bothered to reopen this church, probably because it costs too much to maintain and because it's such a tourist site now. So well, the other thing that the Northern Renaissance does that the Southern Renaissance doesn't is portray everyday ordinary people doing everyday ordinary things. And again, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's the first time it's ever done in art. Peter Bruegel's probably, and his father and son, Peter Bruegel, the elder and the younger, are the most famous proponents of this. Um, and they generally did everyday people doing everyday things. So this is a wedding, poor people wedding. Um, you can see it's kind of crowded. People are kind of all huddled around the table. The bride, by the way, in case you're wondering, is the lady underneath the green piece of cloth with the other red and white thing directly above her head. People are having porridge and rice pudding, which, to again, people from Miami, not a big deal. But rice pudding in the 1500s in Belgium, which doesn't grow any rice. Ooh, these people spent a lot of money having rice pudding, right? Again, um, the other thing that Bruegel does is a series of uh, Netherlandish um, proverbs. So here's one, the blind leading the blind. There's um, several of them. He does the Tower of Babel. He does a bunch of them. I don't know if I, I have all of these for you. This is by far his most famous work, which is the hunters in the snow. So they're coming back from a hunt. The village below, people ice skating on the frozen lakes, people lighting a fire in the house, you know, the background covered with snow in the village. Plus, oh, so here's another series of those proverbs. Um, like I said, there's a bunch of those. There's the Tower of Babel one. But the, he made three different versions of this one, believe it or not. And each one, there's a little bit different in the little detail. So on the you can't really see in this picture because it's not blown up. But if you go to the bottom of the tower where the ocean kind of meets, and there's kind of like a beachy area, on the beach, there's all kinds of crazy things going on, very similar to what Bosch had did. Um, and in each one of the three versions, there are different weird things going on. Um, including my favorite, the guy taking a dump by the water. The Spanish also build these chateaus for their kings. The most famous is El Escorial, which is about 20 minutes outside of Madrid, more or less. So if you do go to Madrid, most people skip it because it's kind of off the beaten path, but this is well worth going to, tourist tip. It is amazing on the inside, amazing on the inside. There's a crazy amount of details um, and all of the kings and queens and princes and princesses of Spain are buried here so there are some amazing tombs too if you're into tombs in the center of El Escorial which is a big rectangular shaped structure is a church because he was the king he figured why should I have to go to church I'm just going to build the church inside my palace and the church will come to me so here's some of those amazingly detailed rooms that I was talking about. The one on the left is kind of um, the central hallway. The one on the right are the tombs of the princesses and princesses, when the baby tombs. So that beautiful wedding cake looking thing there in the center is actually little children that died too young and they're inside those three layers of tombs. It's probably one of the most famous painters in the Spanish part of the Renaissance, probably one of the most famous painters of all time, is El Greco whose real name is, as you can see, nearly unpronounceable in Spanish, Domenicos Theotokopoulos. Um, so in Spain, rather than call him by his name, they just said El Greco, the Greek, because it was easier. So what a lot of people don't know about El Greco, born in Greece, that one I'm sure you figured out, trained in Italy during the Renaissance, moved to Spain, where he became super famous because he got a job with the king of Spain, and that obviously pushed his career forward quite a bit. So what he does is takes this new mannerist style which we haven't talked about yet but we will talk about and and, and when we deal with this italian renaissance and their mannerist style is basically basically taking a person and stretching them out so you'll notice that the cross is too long and jesus is too long and his fingers are too long but that's like his neck is way too long right his ears are way too big his nose is way too long right that's intentional everything is stretched out kind of like silly putty um, he's probably the most famous of the Mannerist painters, period. Although some people would maybe argue Michelangelo's late stuff, but I'd say El Greco. 
Um, this is probably his most famous painting. This is certainly considered the masterpiece of his work. This is the burial of Count Orgaz, probably the greatest name ever. I am the Count of Orgaz, um, who is being buried here, and then he's being brought to heaven in front of Jesus with Mary helping him out, right? Hooking him up. Hey, this is a good guy. Like, send him to heaven. Um, he also does pastoral views and views of cities. Here's one of the city of Toledo. Um, and then there's a ton of things you could read in the Renaissance. Probably almost all of your most famous Shakespeare, uh, Don Quixote, um, Dr. Faustus. Like, there's so many famous works of literature that come out of the renaissance that you could be here forever looking so there's a couple of slurts i did not do the whole plays don't worry but i did do famous parts of it for example i didn't do the whole don quixote thing but if you wanted to look at the famous fighting windmills part um you can you don't have to but i always find that these are good things that you should kind of look at so of course last but not least is the art is not art but literature we can't just skip the can't do the northern renaissance and skip shakespeare we're not going to spend any time on shakespeare but this is the theater that shakespeare performed his plays at the globe theater you'll notice something completely different than modern theaters most of the seating is outside there are some galleries where you could sit but believe it or not those galleries and those boxes which today are the most expensive seats at an opera or theater were for the common folk only the wealthy got to be on the floor. Which still is kind of true in, in, in the thing. Sitting on the floor costs more, right? But also those box seats cost a lot of money too. So here is the Globe Theater today. Obviously it's been remodeled and updated and clear and has a ceiling so that the weather doesn't get in. But you can still go see plays there today, including Shakespeare ones if you're interested. But they also play other regular plays as well. So next we will cover the Baroque, um, and next week we will cover the Renaissance Live. Thanks.